I want to introduce our last speaker of the week, which is Greg Rickenzone. I've known Greg for 20, more than 20 years. He was in, a graduate student in Mike Mersnick's lab when I was a graduate student in John Causa's laboratory. And we've been, since 1995, together at the Center for Neuroscience and have, have been collaborating for almost 20 years. Um, so most of this week has been about development, uh, comparative work, evolution. Um, Greg's going to talk about uh, how the adult brain changes, which for many, many years after the discovery of uh, critical periods was like, okay, here are the critical periods. This is the time your brain is highly plastic and then you're done. You're hardwired. Um, but he did some incredible groundbreaking work with Mike Mersnick in the 1990s looking at how the brain changes with skilled use and has continued to do incredible work on how the brain changes uh, throughout the adult lifetime. Um, so he's, his title of his talk is Cortical Plasticity Throughout Adulthood, Implications on the Evolution of the Nervous System at the Nanosecond Scale. He did say, he's kind of bummed, he doesn't have any cool pictures of octopus in his, his, his talk, but it could be worse because he could be giving a talk behind a Nobel Prize winner who had cool pictures of octopus in his talk right before cocktail hour. So it's not, it's not hopeless. <laughs> Um, like Leah said, we've known each other for uh, a long time, and I was a little bit worried about your introduction because you have so much dirt on me that it would be, <laughs> but uh, I have a whole different set of slides in case you did do that, because I have a lot on you too. So we, we do a Mexican standoff. <clears throat> okay, so um, thank you, Leah, for the kind introduction and invitation, and I'd like to thank Paul and Tony, and especially Anna for uh, all you guys have done to put this meeting together, which has really been terrific. Um, last year, Leah asked me if I wanted to do this, and I said, I don't know anything about development or evolution. I can't do that. And so I didn't come. And then she came back, and she, for like two months, that's all she talked about. And then she invited me again this year, and I thought I can either come and have a great time and do this, or listen to her talk about it for two months <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> and so the choice was pretty obvious. So, so here I am. And she asked me, she said, um, I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? She said, well, uh, students these days, they don't get too much information about cortical plasticity. Cortical plasticity is a given. Everybody knows that it happens all the time. And so maybe it would be nice if I gave a little bit of a, the history behind it and then talked about what she was saying, some uh, studies that I did with Mike Mersnick on how you can change the brain and how that influences uh, the percepts. And then I'll talk about um, a question that really bugged me when I first started doing this. And, and that's how do you represent perceptions in a non-topographic piece of cortex? And most of the interesting cortex, if you think about it, and just thinking, is non-topographically organized. And then I'll kind of finish up in talking about what happens in a normal brain as you get older, okay? So uh, much older. And finally, try to tie this all together and see if I can't make some inroads into what this means for development and um, evolution. Okay, so we'll start with a brief history of cortical plasticity. So uh, it's not brief in the sense of time, really. I'm going to start with William James, who wrote the um, Principles of Psychology in uh, 1890. And in that, <clears throat> he was describing learning. And he said in there that adults are able to learn new skills and behaviors really easily. And it's ubiquitous. And in fact, it's so, uh, so common that no one feels the need to actually try to understand it or to explain it, right? So back in the 1890s, our brains were very plastic, which was given by the fact that we can learn all kinds of new things. And then uh, a little bit later, Sir Charles Sherrington and Thomas Graham Brown did a series of experiments in the motor cortex of monkeys and apes. And they have this really cool uh, paper here on the instability of the cortical point, which was published in 1912. And what they show in that is that if you microstimulate a brain in the motor cortex, and you do that for a while, you actually change the motor map. Okay, so you can do this over the course of minutes. The reason I learned about this is uh, some 75 years later, Randy Nudo did exactly that same experiment and thought he invented this or discovered it and then did a good literature search and found out that he had been scooped by 75 years. So the moral of that story is if you find something cool, don't go look it up because you'll find out somebody did it a long time ago. <clears throat> uh, then there was Carl Lashley who spent a lot of time trying to find the engram. He was looking for when an animal learns something new, what part of the brain changes that gives rise to this new behavior, or this new knowledge, or this new learning. And he's got this great quote, which he said near the end of his career, which is, this series of experiments has yielded a good bit of information about what and where the memory trace is not. I sometimes feel, in reviewing the evidence on the localization of the memory trace, that the necessary conclusion is that learning is just not possible. 
Okay, so he just couldn't find it. All right. <clears throat> so uh, all this was going on until Hubel and Weasel. We've seen this picture before. And they did the landmark studies that showed not only how uh, cortical columns uh, were organized, but also that there's a critical period. As Leah said, if you, uh, because of these guys, it really revolutionized uh, the way neuroscientists thought about how the brain worked. Okay? All these neuroscientists' brains were changed by reading these papers, right? and they realized that their brains can no longer change. Right? That was kind of the, the odd thing about all that. Right? <clears throat> Okay, so yeah. So anyway, there were a couple of clowns around that time that got together, and that would be Mike Mersnick and John Koss. So Mike was a postdoc for Jersey Rose at the University of Wisconsin, while John was an assistant professor there. And they did a bunch of experiments together and ended up forging a, life a lifelong friendship. And then uh, Mike, being the way Mike is, decided he'd go to Vanderbilt on sabbatical, and they did a bunch of studies on owl monkeys. Okay, and this is what an owl monkey looks like. We've heard a little bit about them from Barbara before. They're a nocturnal monkey, and there was uh, um, a couple of reasons that they decided to look at the somatosensory cortex of the owl monkey. And I should note that uh, after Brian's talk, these monkeys, in those days anyway, they were all wild caught. Okay, so they have all the normal kinds of upbringing, rearing things that happen in owl monkeys as opposed to you know, laboratory bred or whatever. <clears throat> I always thought that that was a bad idea because basically these are the monkeys that were dumb enough to get caught. So all these studies are on dumb monkeys. Okay. <clears throat> So that's maybe not such a good reason to use owl monkey. <clears throat> but a really good reason to use them is their hands. Okay? They have really elaborate, nice hands, and they're nice and small. And the main reason, really, is because of their brains. Okay, so here's the lateral view of the owl monkey brain and dorsal and ventral view. And they have a nice uh, lateral sulcus, but really no central sulcus. So if you compare that to a macaque monkey that has a really deep, deep central sulcus, where the primary somatosensory cortex is down inside of that. Right? And the owl monkey, okay, so it's down in here somewhere. Yeah, down, down here somewhere. And the owl monkey, this is central dimple, it's called, and the hand representation is right here, which is what Mike would call out in the flat. Okay, so you can take your electrode and you can, you can you anesthetize the animal, expose the skull, remove the dura, take a picture of it, and then you can see where you stick your electrodes and uh, do what's called a, a map. Okay, so how that works in practice is you open up the skull, you take your electrode and you stick it into this spot right here, and then you record and ask, where do I have to touch the skin in order to get a response, right? And uh, the verbiage there was uh, just visible skin indentation with an opaque glass probe. Okay, what that means is you got this little piece of blue grass, glass, and you just touch it as lightly as you can feel it. Okay, so it's really light. <clears throat> and so if you do it here at point one, you see that it's the very tip of the pinky finger is what all you have to do. That's the receptive field. Then you pull the electrode out, stick it into point two, and you see it's still on the pinky, but a little bit more uh, proximal, and say three, four, and five, and it marches proximally down the digit. If you go across from one to Q to A, you see that the receptive fields march across the tips of the digits. And then you get this map. Okay? So it takes you know, all night to do this, but at the end of the day, you can draw lines around the digit representations and see what it all looked like. Okay, so there's another important point about this. It's what you notice is, so see, uh, G and H over here, which are these two over here. H is completely on the third digit, and G is completely on the second digit. It's really rare to find receptive fields in this kind of map of area 3B that were on both digits. Okay, they're almost always on one or the other. So Mike and uh, John do this for a bunch of monkeys, and they get maps that look like this. Okay, so at the top here is the 3A, 3B border. 3 3A is cutaneous representations. 3B, which I'll, or 3A, is uh, non-cutaneous. It, it doesn't respond to just the visible skin indentation. You have to mash on the muscles or something like that, or move the joints, right? And this is the cutaneous part. And there's two ways you can look at this. <clears throat> one way is to say they're all alike. They all have digits one, then two, then three, then four, then five. They always have the distal tips next to uh, this area 3B, 3A border, and the wrist down here uh, in that direction, right? <clears throat> The other way you can look at it, which is the way those guys looked at it, and they said, look how every one of these is different. Right? Every individual monkey has a different looking map. These shaded parts are doing the, the hairy skin on the back. And you can see that they're not always in the same place. Right? And you can also see that sometimes the representation here, number four, is really big, where in another monkey it's be smaller. Right? And so since it was critical period, et cetera, one might think that sometime before the critical period was over, you had maybe some use-dependent differences, right? Or maybe it's just genetic, right? Monkeys, look, they don't look different to us, but they must look different to each other, right? So their brain maps look different, so, you know, what's the big deal? 
Well, um, then uh, they thought, well, if it's the case that there's this uh, critical period and it's all hardwired and it can't be changed, what do you suppose would happen if we amputated a single digit? Well, if you thought that, then this would just be quiet, right? There's no input anymore, so this part of the brain would do nothing, right? And so they did that experiment. And in my view, this is probably the, the best example of adult cortical plasticity experimentally that you'll ever see, right? So what they did is they mapped this monkey beforehand, then they amputated the digit, waited uh, two months, and what they see is this part here, digit three, which they had amputated, is this part of the cortex is now responding to the two digits on either side. So there was massive reorganization. Right? This was an extremely un unexpected finding, right? because everybody knew that it didn't change in the adult. Right? And here it changed quite dramatically. <clears throat> OK, so that, that spawned a whole series of experiments in those two labs that um, we were just constantly trying to figure out what, what and how could you move these things around. OK, so like I said before, all the distal tips uh, or the digits are always, or the receptive fields are always on one digit or the other. And so then he collaborated with this woman named Sharon Clark, who was a hand surgeon at Stanford. And what she did is she induced, and uh, I think Mark talked about this a little bit, she induced an experimental syndactyly, where you basically cut the skin along the fingers here, sew these parts together and these parts together, and you make a four-fingered monkey. Okay? And these monkeys, they, they act like they're a four-fingered monkey. I mean, they use these two digits together as though they're just normal. And then did the map. And what they found, this is with Terry Allard, they found that this whole huge region right here responded with receptive fields that crossed the suture line. Okay? And, so, and so this never happens in a normal monkey. Right? And the thinking was, well, that's because now it's just like one big finger. And if the way you map these changes is, um, you know, the way that these maps occur is by how often do you get stimulated. And you, re you don't get stimulated on both fingers very often unless they're connected. That's how they got separated. Right? The cool thing that Sharon could do then, she always amazes with her surgical skills, she could cut, uh, she basically, cut the fingers apart and sewed them back up as they were before, and then went back and looked and said, are there still two receptive fields on both digits, which in fact there were. Okay, so it's not something weird like the primary afferent crossed the suture line or something like that. It truly was cortical. It wasn't peripheral in nature how they did this. <clears throat> okay, so if the idea is that if you have constant stimulation, right, or coincident stimulation, and that will change the, the uh, synaptic weights on your cortical cells and change the receptive fields. And so then Bill Jenkins did an experiment that was also really cool. And he said, well, do you have to cut something off or sew something together? Can you just, by touching stuff, can you get changes in your cortex? And so he did that by um, teaching monkeys to stick their hand out of their cage onto this little aluminum disc that was spinning around. And on that disc, it had ridges cut into it. So the monkey had to reach out and touch this thing as it was spinning and get thousands and thousands and thousands of stimuli across its fingertip or two, right? And if it held it there for 10 or 15 seconds, then banana pellet would come out, and that was his only food. Okay? So basically, this monkey learned to hold on to this thing for food. Okay? And the reason it was important to rotate wasn't just so you could make the stimulus, but if you kind of ignored it, your hand would fall off. Okay? So you've got to pay some attention to make sure that you're applying just enough pressure to make this work. So what's the results of that experiment? So here before, um, they did this differential stimulation, put their hand on the rotating disc, and here's the map after. So it was this little piece of skin that he videotaped that was always getting stimulated. And he said, well, how much of the cortex has a receptive field that includes any part of the skin? And it was this little gray part here. And then he said, how about after stimulation? And this is millions of stimuli that these animal experiences. And it becomes huge. Right? There's this big growth here. And then the interesting thing that he also saw was that if you look at the 3A, 3B border that was defined physiologically, he didn't do any histology, but it seems pretty clear that that's where it was, it changed a lot. And that's shown down here, that there's a whole big region that now is cutaneous. Okay? It's not supposed to be cutaneous. It's supposed to just be deep. Okay. okay, so this is about when I showed up to the lab. And this was about when your parents were making bad decisions that influenced your brain development and hadn't really met each other yet. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> but uh, so, so I'm going to talk about this next. And so what I thought was, OK, we've been pussyfooting around this for long enough. You've been saying, Mike, that all this is related to your changes in perceptions and learning new skills and behavior, and you're not actually measuring any skills or behaviors. So why don't we do an experiment, sort of like Bill's, where you stimulate the bejesus out of a piece of skin, but you tell the monkey to tell you if, what it's perceiving. right? 
And if James and Skinner and all those guys are right, then they should get better the more they practice it, and that should change their brain, and it should be related. That's the way, that's, that's the way you've been saying it works. Right? So let's see that. So, um, so that's what I did. And so I, I, this slide kills me. It's so ridiculously elaborate. Oh, I got a fiber optic light. <clears throat> You put a monkey in a box, okay? You tell it to stick its hand out and grab onto this hand mold, which is shown on the top here. And it's, it's, it was custom made for each monkey. And you teach the monkey to stick their hand on a certain way, so that's always the same. And there's holes in it uh, for the different digits, and you can bring this thing up and you can stimulate the skin from underneath, right? So the trick is teach the monkey a trick, and then they'll get their food. What was the you trick? It's tactile, yeah. So it's shown here. So this is how complicated I like to make things back when I was much younger. And so this is really the only important part. Okay? <laughs> so what happens is the monkey puts their hand on the thing, and then the tactile probe goes up and presses against the skin, and then it vibrates at 20 hertz. And then it stays pressed against the skin, but doesn't vibrate. Then it, and it goes at 20 hertz over and over until eventually it goes at something faster. When it goes faster, the monkey lets go, gets the banana pellet. He does, and he gets a timeout. Okay, so it's that simple kind of thing. And I'll get back to this uh, in a bit, but while he's doing that, there's a speaker over his head that's doing beeps that he can safely ignore. It's beep, 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 doesn't mean anything, right? He's got to focus on this, and when it goes faster, let go. <clears throat> so you teach the monkey, it takes forever to teach him to stick their hand out and do it, get, that, get it on right and all that stuff. And when you finally get to start doing the experiment, you see a function like this. This is the change in frequency, so this is 26 hertz instead of 20. This is the percent correct or performance or something. And by the third time he's actually acting like he gets it, he has a function that looks like this. Threshold is something around 8 hertz. Okay? So he's bopping along. And then what you do is, as time goes by, you make it a little bit harder, but he gets a little bit better. Okay? This is a couple weeks later, many weeks later, and uh, very, very many weeks later. Okay? So he goes from being you know, pretty crappy with the 8, 8 hertz difference to now he's banging out 2 hertz trials pretty reliably. So this is exactly what's supposed to happen, right? They're supposed to get better. So now he can, he can totally tell the difference between 20 and 23 hertz, whereas before, he couldn't even, we didn't even try it. Right? So now he's much better. Is that really the, the lowest uh, uh, resolution monkeys can get, 2 hertz, you think? Uh, you'll see. There's okay. the one that got above, just above 1 on average. <clears throat> right? Now the cool thing is, uh, since I put those holes in different spots and the monkey understands the task, one day I'll sneak in there when he's not looking and I'll change it to the other finger. Okay, so now he got his unpracticed finger, and here you see that the untrained finger started pretty crappy and it never got better. Okay, if you just test it once or twice or three times over the course of months, it just doesn't change. Okay. So then what do you do? So you spend months and months and months training this animal to do this thing, and then you uh, wait till he's really, really good, and then you get up the next morning, you anesthetize him, and you start to map him. And what we wanted to look at was both 3B, where we expected all kinds of cool things. We also wanted to look at 3A, because Jenkins had shown that that border moved a little bit. So we thought, well, we should look there, too. And, and Bill and I had an argument about that, a friendly argument. And he said um, that the reason that it changed is because he was doing the distal tips, and it was just right there. And I would never see a change in 3A, because I was stimulating the middle of the digit. Okay, it was just too far away. So we had a friendly bet on that. <clears throat> Okay, and then, so this is um, from the Journal of Physiology paper. What you see on the left, every one of these points is a place where we stuck an electrode, okay? And we, I'm showing you an example from two animals that did the training, right? <clears throat> and then, what, so then, once you get all that, you think, ooh, I'm done. But I was really anal compulsive in those days, and I said, you know what we ought to do? We ought to do the contralateral hand. That's a great control. It's unstimulated. It's in the same monkey, right? So then you flip the monkey over and do the other hand, 3A and 3B, and that's shown over here. <clears throat> And so I'll just give you a flavor for what these experiments were. It was, I designed it all double blind and all that stuff. Uh, it was pretty lame to do that because if you look at these control hemispheres, and this is just the receptive fields, a smattering of what you got, and this is the size down here. They were, this is what normal owl monkey 3B receptive fields look like. Okay, they're small and they're like this. Then you go to the experimental hemispheres where the skin was that was being stimulated, and they look completely different. Right? So double blind meant nothing. You know, as soon as the guy maps this receptive field, he knows that this is a trained monkey and a trained finger and da 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 da. I mean, you just can't can't fool anybody, right? It's just so different. Right? They, they have huge receptive fields and, and they're really big. And this is where the monkey was stimulated, right here at this point. <clears throat> okay, so that's a pretty cool finding. It doesn't really mean anything with respect to um, you know, how did the monkey get better? He got bigger receptive fields. That didn't really seem to make much sense. And, but I also want to show you another control that we did. 
So remember these guys, these beeps that were happening. Well, I had another set of monkeys that were putting their hand on the stimulator thing, and they were feeling the exact same stimuli, but they were paying attention to these, and they were telling me when the frequencies changed, okay? and completely ignoring this tactile stimulus. Right? So they're getting the same thing down here, right? but they're paying attention to the sounds coming from up above. And if you map their hemispheres, they look like normal monkey hemispheres, okay? even though they were extensively stimulated. So you had to pay attention for this thing to change your receptive fields in your maps. So like I was saying, um, receptive field size, I mean, it wasn't a spatial task. It was a temporal task. How fast is the thing vibrating, right? So in addition to just mapping the receptive field, we also took the stimulator gizmo and stuck it on that piece of skin, regardless of where the receptive field was, and asked what happens, right? And the kinds of responses you get is either nothing, if the receptive field's on the thumb or something, nothing happens when you stimulate here, right? But if it is anywhere nearby, you can either get what I call the frequency following response, which is where you get a series of action potentials with every phase of the cycle, okay? and non-frequency, which was usually just an onset response and nothing to the rest. Okay? So these are the ones that will tell the monkey, presumably, how fast the thing is vibrating. Right? <clears throat> and so we looked at and, so, and just asked a simple question, how many cells do this? And in the passive con stimulation controls, so these are the guys that we were listening to the auditory stimuli, here for the stimulated digit, there was just right where they're supposed to be. If you were on the receptive field, you had a frequency following response. The dots are where you didn't get one, right? And the squares are where it was on the adjacent digit that, um, you know, to the other side, right? <clears throat> and you see for both monkeys, this is all very well behaved. This is what normal 3B looks like. You don't respond to stuff unless your receptive field is right there. The experimental hemispheres look totally different. Okay, so what you're seeing here is stimulated digit, homologous digit, both digits. All of this area here in 3B, this is where it's supposed to be, and it has all this extra. Here it's supposed to be here, but it has all this extra. And look at 3, 3A. 3A has a ton of frequency following tactile responses, okay, which you never see anywhere else. <clears throat> so what, what to make it out? Okay, so what do you do with this? So you have these frequency following responses. Turns out there's all kinds of cool analysis tricks you can do. You can look at vector strength, you can look at interstimulus interval, and all this kind of stuff, uh, interspec interval. But what I did is I said, well, you're trying to figure out what's the frequency of the stimulus, and is it slower or faster than the one before, right? So how could you look at this? In a simple-minded way, see, this is a good thing about being naive and not doing literature searches. You invent these really harebrained analyses. <clears throat> so what I did was I invented this harebrained analysis, which I called the, the two-cycle histogram. And so what you do is you divide this, so you, so you take these two, and then you um, say, what's the difference between you know, this one and the next one, and this one and the next one, and this one and the next one? And you get some idea of the periodicity of that particular, of that particular response. right? And, and then I did that by individual cells, and they all looked pretty much the same. And I thought, dude, there are so many of these cells in the stimulated skin, right? they must be doing something. What happens if you pull them all together? Because that's a signal coming out of the monkey's head. right? It's all the cells, not just that one. So I did that. I call that a population. Um, two cycle histogram or something like that. And so what you see here is a trained digit. So I'm not showing the, the first cycle. That's over here somewhere. So this is really the difference from the last one, okay, is what you're seeing. And you see that the trained digit is super sharp and big, and the adjacent digit is broad and, and slower. Right? So what does this mean? Well, the, really the comparison is, what's the difference between 20 hertz and, say, 22 hertz? Because right? that's where it's around threshold, or 28 hertz, or, or 30 hertz, or whatever. So that's shown here. And what you see is the train digit, the all train digit, and the dark one is for the 20 hertz in all four panels, and the other one is for the other frequency, 21 or 22 or 24 or 26. Okay. So when you look at this and you think, okay, I've got some little monkey that's listening to all this out and deciding, should I let go in order to get my banana pellet, right? And so if you were that little monkey having to decide, this is all happening in time, not in space, right? And you can see there's a lot of overlap between these two, and it's going to be hard to tell them apart. Right? Down here, this should be dead easy. Right? This is super easy because they're not even overlapping in time at all. Right? And these guys, you know, these, are, these should be easy, those should be kind of hard, et cetera. Okay? So what you can do, you can do this for each monkey, for each digit that you've got your data from. Right? And then you can ask, well, what's the percent of overlap between these two? You can ask D prime, you can do all kinds of different metrics. Right? We tried a whole bunch. And you can see that whatever the metric is, it should predict a pretty uh, poor performance here and a very good performance here. Okay? And then you can say, well, what did the monkey really do? Right? And compare those two directly. So that's shown on the next slide here. And this is uh, for two different animals. Right? And, and what you have is the behavioral, which I guess is uh, open, and the predicted, which is closed. 
And you see for the trained and the untrained digit that they line up pretty well. Okay? And in fact, you can go even further and just take the threshold for that one versus the threshold for that one, and the threshold for that one, and the threshold for that one, and do this for all your things and ask, how good is this simple metric of, I got sharper frequency following responses now, how well does that help me do this task? Right? And what you see is it works really well. Okay, so here you have the threshold that we measured in the monkey and the one we predicted from this population two cycle histogram thing. Right? And some monkeys are, so here you go, Paul, this is it, this is the best monkey, it was 21 and a skosh, right? And then usually they're around 22 or 23. This one was really stupid, never really figured it out. <clears throat> but it makes the uh, correlation really good. Okay. So what you get at the end of the day, <laughs> I hated this monkey until it did that. <laughs> 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 yeah. <clears throat> okay, so we do a temporal task. We measure temporal <clears throat> response properties. And I should say we looked also at the cortical size and all that stuff. And it was correlated too, but much sloppier. This was the best correlation that we came up with. Right? <clears throat> And so, um, so there I am uh, thinking that I, was, I did the right thing. And um, I was working with Christoph Schreiner then, and he was this big auditory guy. And he said, you're an idiot. You should, measure, you should look at the auditory cortex of these guys that your passive stimulation controls. And I was like, I'm afraid. It's auditory. And he says, no, no, I will help you. <coughs> so, so he got me into the lab. And so remember, so we have this. And so the, a frequency discrimination in the auditory system, you can think of it, and some people do, and it's, I'm going to air quote the whole time. Imagine I'm air quoting everything that I say for the next few sentences. You can think about it as being a spatial task, because if you have one frequency, it's going to stimulate the hair cells at a certain point on the cochlea, and if you make it higher, then it goes uh, towards the apex. Right? So it's kind of like a spatial task, right? so in, in a sense, from the cochlear point of view. OK, so we're going to do the spatial, the spatial task in, in the um, auditory system. And so uh, we've got a normal owl monkey. Christoph taught me how to do this. Um, in, the, in the auditory cortex, it's a little bit out on the flat, and then it curls down into the sulcus. <clears throat> okay, so that's why these are all straight, because they're going down the sulcus. But what you see is the classic isofrequency representations that you learn about in the textbook. And so all of these guys are between 1 and 2 kilohertz, and these are between 2 and 4, 4 and 8, et cetera, et cetera. And so what I did then is said, well, let's look at all the points where the V-shaped tuning curve includes the frequencies that I tested the animal on. Okay? And, the, and that's um, these four points for 2.5 kilohertz, actually none for 5 kilohertz, and these 1, 2 for 8 kilohertz. Okay? And when you actually do this, you read in the textbook and you see the picture and everything, the, you, know, you have to do these octave bandwidths because it's pretty sloppy. It's pretty sloppy organization. Right? <clears throat> so that's why these aren't making a, a nice light line across there. OK, what happens if you take an animal that supposedly used to look like this and teach it to discriminate these 2.5 kilohertz frequencies? That's what you get in this side. And sure enough, you get lots more points scattered all hither and yon that are responding to the 2.5 kilohertz stimulus, okay? just like we would have predicted. Now keep in mind, this guy was the passive stimulation control. His 3B didn't show anything, right? because he's listening to the beeps. Right? We looked at 5 kilohertz. This is a monkey that was doing the task and showed all huge 3B representation changes and 3A representation changes, and basically nothing happened to the sounds that it was ignoring. Right? Whereas the monkey that was paying attention had a big representation change. Okay? So we did this for four different frequencies, and the last slide, the next slide, shows you this. So this is the trained frequency for uh, the tra animal trained at that frequency, the animal trained for that frequency, and that two that were trained for this. These are the um, uh, passive stimulation controls here don't really do much. We had other just normal monkeys that we looked at. And pretty much if you train at a certain frequency, that frequency representation gets bigger. Okay? And you can do the correlation analysis and you see the same kind of thing as before. Okay? So what happens when you do something is you change your maps. Right? If you do a temporal task when it's vibrating your finger and you're paying attention to it, 3B and 3A go nuts. Right? If you're listening to a sound and trying to figure out what that sound is, your auditory cortex changes, okay? and, and, but you have to be paying attention to them. Okay, <clears throat> I think I, I just said what I'm going to. So I didn't, I didn't discover this. This has been hundreds of years old. Right? The temporally based task leads to temporal changes. The spatially based task leads to spatial changes, and you've got to pay attention. And the other thing to keep in mind, it's I'm going to come back to at the end, is everybody's different. Okay? They start at a different level, and they end at different levels, and the representations change at different levels, but basically the same way. So there's a lot of individual variability that we saw all that stuff. <clears throat> now, are there interaction effects now between the auditory and the, the tactile? Are there interaction effects? Yeah. Would you expect that? 
um, only if what you were doing was made you pay attention to both, mm -hmm. right? So if you were doing some sort of cross-modal uh, discrimination, then I would definitely predict that would happen. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know if you're going to get to this, and so we'll just ignore it otherwise. But if, uh, so the Hubel and Weasel um, uh, binocular thing, you don't have to pay attention. You don't have to pay attention for ocular dominance homes for, for that to work. There's also the Jenny Saffron thing with statistical learning for auditory system in which you, people are made not to pay attention that it does work with babies. So, uh, so what, why does it why does it happen here? You yeah. know, um, that's a good question, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to get to it, right? Yeah. But let me just say that uh, the thinking at the time was that uh, you had to have attention and you had to have your acetylcholine and all that to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be more competitive than that. I mean, you're not, these monkeys were not only not paying attention, they were actively ignoring, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that might have That's something to do. the case for like the, the Jenny Saffron, they're, they're actively, in, they're yeah, they're, they're yeah, yeah, I'm not, peak, uh, you know, for the people though, that's, they're, they're trying to learn a grammatical rule by something saying pika, puka, behind while they're doing some other task. Yeah. yeah. That's a mystery to me too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but yeah. Jack, it's really necessary to call this attention because in some sense mm -hmm. it's, it's all about the contingencies of the task. Yes. Right? So actually all you can really say is, is okay, how is a certain cue in the task coupled to the reward the animal gets? Sure. Right? So to really, we don't even have to call this attention. We don't have to. It's no. just a contingency. It's coupled to the contingency. Yeah. Would that be a safer way to interpret it? Um, I'm just worried it's, about you, you know? It, it's not, <laughs> it doesn't, it, if you use the word attention, you, you get more grant dollars, though. So uh, that's, <laughs> good point. That's kind, of the way, that's kind of the way we floated it anyway. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so we agree. Uh, yeah, we agree. Okay. Yeah. Let's call it consciousness then. That will well, you know, that more. would be something to do, too. Okay. So there, there I am finishing that. And... Um, thinking that these temporal tasks on the finger, frequency discriminations, are pretty simple tasks, right? S1 and A1 are really nicely topographically organized, right? And the training alters the size of the representations, but not the general organization. And then what I was stuck in is I was thinking that uh, interesting perceptions and behaviors don't really map on the topographic space very well, okay? And I was, I went, after I left Mike's lab, I went to Bob Wirtz's lab, and I studied MT and MST and awake behaving macaque monkeys, because that was the optogenetics of its day, and I wanted to learn that technique. And um, MT, I kind of could wrap my head around. MT is a place that does visual motion uh, perception, and it's linked, with, it's linked to perception. Bill Newsom showed that really nicely. And, and, and it's all directional, and it's, you know what to put on the x-axis with firing rate on the y-axis. You get tuning and all that. Um, I was hanging out a lot with the postdocs that were down in Bob Desimone's lab with uh, Leslie Ungerleiter, and they were doing V4 and IT and all that stuff, and it's like, guys, what are you doing? I mean, you have, what's the difference between a red square and a green bar? And then what do you put on the x-axis and a face? How's face being represented? Like, how do you do that? And, and they said, oh, you know, we still don't know, right? So I was like, how can you do that? And how can you study a simple percept that's not represented in the cortex in a topographic way? Okay, so that was the question that I had. And uh, that brings me to this next topic here. Okay, so I'm thinking about this, and I'm going, how can you do this? And then uh, I get a job, which is real serendipitous. If you know Mike Kazaniga, sometimes you just end up with a job, and you didn't even <laughs> apply. <laughs> he just shook his hand at a Christmas party, and the next thing you know, you're an assistant professor. And, and, I, and I was thinking, well, i got to do something now. And, you know, I, I didn't want to go back to training owl monkeys and doing all the hard work and all that stuff. I, want, I liked using the, the macaque monkey, but I didn't want to do visual cortex either because even in MT, I mean, I didn't want to do the IT and all that stuff because I didn't know what the heck was going on. And then in MT and MST, I had Tony Moshin and Bill Newsom and Bob Wirtz and all these heavy hitters. And it's like, what am I going to be able to do? But I had done that auditory thing before, and I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know what? Hardly anybody does awake behaving macaque monkey auditory stuff. There was more Michigan and Joseph Rauschecker, and I think that was about it at the time. And I thought, well, if I did that, I could certainly break into the top five, right? <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> I got, a, sh I got a, a shot at it. And so then, well, okay, what am I going to do? And then I thought, you know what? I, I got this poser here. How can you do this? How can I, how can I do this? And I, then I realized sound localization might be the way that you could study this in a cortical area, right? Because the lesions of the auditory cortex result in sound localization deficits. Okay, but only in the contralateral hemisphere. So you need your cortex to do this. Okay, so at least it was cortically mediated. 
There's no topographic representation of auditory space in the cortex, just not. A lot of people have looked for it. Nobody's got any close, any evidence that there is anything like that. And the key to sound localization, as opposed to V4 and IT, is that we know what the nervous system is trying to represent, azimuth and elevation. So I know what to put on my x-axis, right? <clears throat> so I decided, okay, I'm gonna work on monkeys. This is a macaque monkey, if you haven't seen one before. They uh, you know, look very intelligent and they're very introspective and learned. Uh, they've made a lot of, we know a lot about the visual system because of these animals. These are super smart animals. These are the ones that the, the, audit, uh, the visual guys get. The auditory guys were still new, so they give us these ones. <clears throat> but I'm used to working with dumb monkeys because they got caught in the wild, so this seems about appropriate. Right? <clears throat> so if you take everything unimportant away from a uh, rhesus monkey, this is what you're left with. And uh, what you have here is uh, the lateral sulcus and the central sulcus. So 3B is buried down in here. A1 and auditory cortex is buried down here and kind of comes out on the end like this. Okay? So what we do is we uh, anesthetize the animal, put on a recording chamber, let them wake up, teach them a task. right? And then every day we can take an electrode and we can stick it into the brain through some unimportant parietal lobe or something and then record from uh, the superior plane of the superior temporal gyrus. Right? So we take metal electrodes, we stick them up close to cells, and we record the spikes. Okay? So all the things that I'm going to talk about for the rest of this time, there's no laser, there's no transfecting anything, there's no transgenic anything. I'm taking a stick and putting it in a brain and counting the spikes, okay? and trying to figure out you know, when did they happen. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to just count spikes that we got from sticks. Okay. If you look down on the auditory cortex, the way it's organized, is that there's a so-called core. So this is A1. All animals have an A1. And the primate that extends to this core field, there's three different fields. They're surrounded by these belt fields, and then there's this parabelt. And the, th this is all in the sulcus here, and this is the part that kind of comes out. And Joseph Rauschecker, when he was working with Mort, thought, wouldn't it be cool if we have dual processing, what and where, which, uh, where and what, pathways, just like in the visual cortex, and like many before and after him, let's just stick uh, visual cortex rules onto the auditory cortex and see what happens. And uh, so the idea here is that processing starts in A1, goes to CL, and that's spatial processing, and then it goes this way for whatever non-spatial processing is. Okay? <clears throat> and so what I did is I stuck my recording cylinder right over here, and I recorded from all these different cortical areas and asked how well can the monkey localize sounds and how does it match up. Right? And the prediction is it's going to work really well over here, it's not going to work so well over here, or whatever. Okay, so what did I do? So I thought, I'm going to do it just in azimuth for these experiments, and I'm going to change the intensity of the white uh, broadband noise. And the reason I chose that is because different neurons respond different, very differently to different amplitudes. It's not like a contrast sensitivity function in the visual system. They don't all get more spikes the louder you get. Some go up and down, and some start high, some go flat. Right? So there's lots of variation. But your sound localization ability is really stable over a broad intensity range. Okay, so now I, I'm going to have different neural activity and sort of the same behavior, and so maybe that will give me some insights how to do this. So what happens in practice? So the monkey sits in a, in a sound booth with this ring of speakers around it, and it's trained to listen to these sounds, and they're 200 millisecond um, bar band noises, so they sound like psh, like that. And they'll come from one speaker, and then maybe louder from another, and then maybe another, and it, and when it comes twice in a row, basically one back task, you let go of the lever, you get some juice. Okay? And you do that for an hour. <clears throat> At the end of the hour, I can count up the spikes. Okay? So what you're seeing here, each one of these raster plots, each line is a single trial, each dot is an action potential, and they're all sorted now by the speaker location. They came out randomly to the monkey. Right? Now, you don't have to be a, a, a neurophysiologist to go, hey, Greg, there's more dots over here than over here. Right? So this is the tuning. You also don't have to be a brain scientist to go, you know, there's dots on all of these, right? So the tuning is really broad, but there's more dots over here than over here. Okay. And then if you look at the individual neurons, right, and instead of plotting them like this, what I'm going to do is take the average for each of these sets, and I'm going to plot it as a PSTH. Right? <clears throat> and here are, uh, what, 16 cells, just to show you the variability. There's four lines in each of these which corresponds to different intensities. So this one is very well behaved. It's, it's uh, lots of spikes, and this is the, the peak response. Lots of spikes in the contralateral hemisphere, when it's loud, less when it's quiet, hardly any when it's quieter still. Right? <clears throat> Here's a, one that kind of breaks the rules. It's the best response at uh, 35 dB. So I should say 25 dB, which is the quietest, is, is quiet. Right? And 75 dB, which was the loudest, is pretty loud. That's about 
So I, I'm, you guys are hearing me at about 70 dB or something like that. <clears throat> okay. But this, this stupid cell fires way better to the quiet sounds, the quiet sounds here, than to the loud sounds. This one has two bumps, and they're all wacky. Right? So what do you do with this kind of data? What I did was all, everything that everybody did before in the cat or whatever, just to see what it was like in the monkey. First thing you can look at is where is the best direction, which is just the direction that goes straight up. And uh, what you see for all this, for A1, CL, CM, ML, MM, and R, so this is supposed to be the space guys over here, and these are the non-space guys. And there is a pretty even distribution across, and they're not significantly different from each other. And you'll notice that sometimes they're ipsilateral fields, but mostly they're contralateral. Okay? And we looked at um, a couple of other metrics. So uh, one was this location index, which is also known as the Baker index, which uh, uh, John Allman came up with for MT cells, probably 20 years before I did this. And it's 1 minus the response in the worst direction divided by the response in the best direction. So in this particular cell, um, if you see here, take the red line, the best direction is pretty high, the worst direction is pretty low, and you get something that's close to 1. If you look at the blue line, um, the best is this much, the worst isn't much different, and you get a little number. Okay? So, the, so the closer to one you get, the more sharply tuned you are. Right? We looked across uh, all the population of cells. There really wasn't much to do with the different intensities, but what you see is here's A1 here, CL piles things up towards one. Okay, so it's sharper, right? it's as predicted. And these other ones are not. Right? And finally we looked at bandwidth, and that's just you go to the half height, right? and see how far you go. So it's going to be 230 degrees in this cell for the quiet sound, and half height here is all of them, 360. Right? This was pretty common if you look at the same kind of thing. So now what you're seeing is um, each individual animal for each different intensity. CL is the lowest. The rest are pretty high. <clears throat> right? And these are medians in first and third quartiles, so there's lots of variability. Right? OK, so if you're looking at this, you're going, OK, Greg proved it. It's a CL. That's the space place. We're done. Right? But remember, I'm trying to figure out how is it that the monkey can use this information to tell where the sound is and see that it came from the same place twice in a row. Right? So how, how do they do that? And, um, and when you think about this, look at this. Uh, this is 90 degrees. Okay? 90 degrees, that's this much. Right? So that's pretty darn big. Right? And so the question is, is the spatial tuning good enough to account for sound localization ability? And what's tough is, the way that I designed this experiment, is I really don't know what is good enough. Right? Now, I can take a monkey and I can train it to tell me which speaker it thought it came from. Remember, I just had to say it was the same place twice. Right? I can teach a monkey to do that. Uh, it's, you can't do it when their head's fixed and they're sitting there because you know, it's somewhere back there. How do you, how do you, monkeys can't point for squat. Right? They're really inaccurate. So I thought, well, the way people do it in ferrets and cats and stuff is they have the animal freely moving, and it starts in a spot, and then you play the sound, and it goes to the speaker and gets a drop of juice. If I did that, the monkey, you put the monkey in there, he's going to rip my speakers all the, and tear the foam off the walls and have a great time and not get anything done. Right? <clears throat> so I thought, I should use a different species that has very similar sound localization ability. And I had done that before, and I had a good species in mind because they don't tend to trash the place. And they do tend to give you that kind of information. And that's what I like to call the naive Aggie. Okay? <clears throat> so you get yourself some naive Aggies. And na naive Aggies are very much like monkeys in a lot of ways. Um, they vary in their intelligence level and stuff. The smart ones tend not to do psychophysical experiments. right? They go do vision experiments or something. So I end up recording from this guy. And guys <laughs> like him. <clears throat> right? But you can tell them what to do. And what they basically had to do was listen to the, they go, sit in the same booth with the same speakers, heard exactly the same sounds, and I had a little clipboard and said, when you hear the sound, tell me which speaker you thought it came from. Right? So they could identify each individual one. Okay? So you hose a guy like this off and give him 15 bucks, and he does that. And what you end up with is this. So this is the error as a function of location for these four different stimuli. And pretty much everybody except the dark blue one, which was the quietest, do you do pretty well. Okay, so like I said before, there's not a whole lot of variability across uh, intensity ranges, and there's a little bit when it's kind of quiet. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so that's what I have to figure out, how to do this sort of performance with this kind of data. Right? How are you going to do that? Well, you're going to do it by trying everything that everybody else has done before. Right? And so that's what I did. I used uh, an ideal observer probability model, which has been in the literature for a long time, a linear pattern discriminator, population vector, et cetera. And I did all those. And what bugged me about all those three, anyway, is I do it, and they all kind of make you set a threshold to decide 
you know, what, am I going to call it that one or this one or, or whatever. And I could manipulate my threshold, and I could make it so A1 was the best space place. I could make it that MM was the best space place. I could make it CL was the best space place. And it was like, who am I to decide how to do this, right? This is dumb. And then I knew about this. This is a, max, a logarithmic maximum likelihood estimator that Tony Moshin had come up with in his group, and that did uh, direction of motion in MT, which is the same problem, right? Because I have 360 degrees, and I have to do essentially the same thing. But it was really complicated. So I recruited Lee Miller, who's my colleague at the Center for Mind and Brain, and he MATLABed it and came up with it in just a few minutes. And basically how this works is you, you imagine that, uh, you know, here's, here's the data that I showed you before. But the monkey doesn't have access to all this, right? The sound plays, you have to decide, right? You don't take averages and all that kind of stuff. So what we did, what Lee did, is I, I gave him all my data, and he said, what we're going to do is we're going to take one trial, you know, from one, look, from one neuron, say this trial right here, that one, and we're going to imagine that the little monkey inside the monkey who decides where it came from has, knowledge, has, ba has general knowledge about you know, the, the tuning of each of these different units, but it only gets 12 spikes. Okay? And it's going to say, what's the probability that the speaker came, that the sound came from here, given that the cell gave me 12 spikes? Right? And there'll be some probability. And then I'll do that for another cell. And that cell will probably have a best direction someplace else, right? But I'll say, what's the probability that it came from here? What's the probability that it came here? And I'll do that to 100 neurons. And at the end of the day, I'll look and see who, who, has, who's, who is the loudest, who says the most. That's the one I pick. Greg doesn't pick anything, right? I'm taking it out of the equation entirely, right? Then you can imagine on another trial, maybe from this neuron, I'll take this one. And I'll say, OK, I got three spikes. What's the probability it came from here, given that you said three spikes? Now, it's very low. Okay. And some other neuron has the best direction here, and it's going to be very high, so it's going to win. Right? So you do that, and uh, we did it for uh, contralateral space and ipsilateral space. So in ip ipsilateral space, you get horrible estimates, right? and due to some tweaks that only Lee Miller can describe, they're actually worse than chance. Right? And then we looked across the population in uh, contralateral space, and what we saw was these data here. So this is MM, which nobody knows what it does, and it wasn't very good. ML is supposed to be a, a, a what place. R is supposed to be a what place. Here's the human average with the standard deviation. Here's CL. CM almost makes it, and CL is dead on. Right? So basically what this is telling me is that if you look across the population of, A1 neuron, or of CL neurons, right, and you have some general idea about the tuning properties of these cells, you can have this completely non-topographically represented um, region tell you with high fidelity where that speaker came from, okay? what, where that sound came from, which speaker. Okay? Which I thought was really cool, because that's probably the way that a lot of really cool things that we use our brains for, that's probably how it's encoded. Right? It's encoded across this population, because you can't topographically rep, rep, you know, represent everything. OK, okay so <clears throat> that was cool. And then um, I, I, I moved into this category, which is really depressing. And I realized that uh, being, uh, you, guys are, you guys are young. This is awesome for you guys, right? So I thought, what happens when you get older? Because all the older people that I knew when I was young would complain about, oh, Greg, you should study aging because hearing sucks when you're older. And it's like, ah, it's for old people, right? <clears throat> so now I'm really enthusiastic about it. <laughs> but, <clears throat> so young, you guys are like this. You guys, these guys are cool. They're strong. They, they rock. You know, they're awesome, right? That's what you want to be. You want to stay young, right? Can't really stay young. Okay, so then you end up being middle-aged, and maybe you'd be governor or something, I don't know, or you still rock out, and that's fine. And then, inevitably, you get old, okay? And you don't really want to be old, but it's better than being dead, right? So, so there we are. And if you get, you know, a good hair dye thing, it, you don't look that old after all. Right? <clears throat> and I don't know, yeah, let's not even talk about Keith Richards. Okay. So, <laughs> so, he's like 200 or something. <clears throat> um, so, what happens when you get older with respect to hearing? Well, it goes south. Okay? So age-related hearing loss or hearing deficits is probably a better way to put it. It's a major health concern. It's the third most common chronic condition in the aging. It's behind heart disease and arthritis. Okay? So, and almost everybody gets it. These are really conservative estimates. These guys are coming up with worse and worse numbers for people as we go. Uh, people are getting older and older and older, right? So this is going to be a major deal as we get really old. So what happens? What, what is the complaints? Right? Very rarely does a person come in and say, hey, doc, I got age-related hearing loss. You know, they don't say that. What do they say? 
Uh, the major complaint is reduced ability to understand speech, especially in a noisy environment. Now, I don't know who these people are. I pulled this off the internet, but this really shows what happens to these people with age-related hearing deficits. So here you have grandma, and she's making hot dogs with junior hair, and they're all happy, and there's mom look, looking lovingly down, and there's the teenage girl embracing her father in all good-natured way. We all experienced that, guys. And here's grandpa, eh, not really keeping up. <clears throat> kind of looking like, eh. Well, he's just fed up with her naked. Okay, He's looking at him, he's just going, geez, don't drop my hot dog. <laughs> I can't hear a damn word anybody saying. <clears throat> okay, so so <laughs> what is, what is that what is what does that mean to a neuroscientist, right? The people do actually usually it's not him that says, Hey Doc, I, I can't understand speech in noisy environments. It's these two will say, We gotta get this guy a hearing aid or something. He's driving us crazy. <clears throat> Okay, so what happens in the lab? What do we call that, right? So if you take these older people in the lab, you find that they have two kind of primary deficits. One is in the ability... <laughs> it's my laboratory. <laughs> I always wanted a big switch. I think I have to get one, just hook it up. One thing that happens is it's really hard to localize sounds, okay? And the other is it's hard to follow fast temporal things, the envelope of the speech. Those are the two main things that you can do when you're impoverished or stimuli, et cetera. And that makes sense, because if you're in a cocktail party, like we're going to be this evening, right, it's really hard to hear people, but we can localize the person we want to listen to pretty well, and we can follow the envelope of their speech, which is what the cochlear implant does. It basically just does the envelope, right? <clears throat> okay, and if you're old and you can't do those things, it's really hard. So here's a tip. If you're ever talking to an old person who has age-related hearing loss, get in their face, and you don't have to talk that much louder, because this happens to people even if they have normal audiograms, right? Just talk more slowly, right? And it'll be a lot easier. <clears throat> okay, so can we do this in monkeys? Well, we can, because the uh, primate center, which is just up the road from campus, or from our labs, has thousands of young animals and scores of old animals. And uh, monkeys, macaque monkeys, it said, I guess, age about three times to that of a human, so a 25-year-old monkey is like a 75-year-old human. Okay? The oldest monkey that I've ever seen in the literature uh, was the equivalent of 107 years old or something like that. <clears throat> okay, so then they usually die in around you know, 30, right, which is around 90. Okay? And they get the best, best care anywhere. They have a bunch of um, vets, et cetera, so you know, they're not like wild monkeys that get caught by the line because they're slow, right? So they get to get nice and old. Now, if you look in rodents or monkeys or people to a lesser extent, what you find is you get age-related hearing loss, this these deficits, even if you have normal audiograms. But what happens is you get all kinds of bizarre changes all throughout your, your brainstem and thalamus. And it's believed, mostly from Donald Casper's work and others, that what's happening is there's reduced uh, excitatory drive out of the cochlea, even if you have normal um, hearing. And what happens is that the brainstem and the midbrain and the thalamus are trying to adapt for this by decreasing inhibition. Okay, so there's all kinds of evidence that the general conclusion is that the brain is trying to compensate by decreasing inhibition throughout the way. Okay? And different species do it in different ways, and different places do it in different ways, with uh, you know, calbindin or palvalbumin or uh, uh, the expression of this uh, molecule or that or whatever. Right? <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is the same experiment I had already showed you guys in these animals, and I'm going to do it in some of these guys. Okay, so here's the audiograms. These are behavior. I can teach a monkey to press down on a lever. When you hear a sound, let go, and then you just make them quieter and quieter. And this is the threshold at these different frequencies. The two old monkeys are dark, and the two young monkeys are light. So these are 77 and 79 versus 31 and 43. And importantly, these are the noise stimuli that we're going to use. Okay, so these monkeys can hear fine. Okay, so it's not, you don't have to compensate for a hearing loss. And they did essentially the same task, and we got the same, we counted up the same kinds of spikes like we were doing before. And so now the question is, <clears throat> let's see what the responses are. Okay, so here's the old monkeys, and here's the young monkeys. This is spontaneous activity, so this is just right before the sound is going to come on. And these are medians and first and third quartiles, and sure enough, there's higher spontaneous activity in the old monkeys, which makes sense because they have this reduced inhibition. That's what we, that's what we were taught, right? Compared to young, this is an area CL. We just did A1 and CL because that's what we just did. And in fact, these are statistically significantly different than these. So there's more activity. Okay. If you look at uh, the young guys at these different stimulus intensities, and then you see that it gets a little bit bigger 
as you go, right? But not a great deal. And the question is, what happens to the old monkeys? Well, I would have preferred to do all four of these, but we couldn't because they don't work that long. They get tired, they fall asleep, etc. So we had to pick one, and after much debate, uh, we decided to go with 65 dB because we didn't really know how well they would be able to hear at the end of the study, which is when we took the audiograms. And we figured, well, we'll be in the ballpark here. So let's look at 65 dB because it's the only one we did. And it's off the charts. Okay? Again, these are medians and first and third quartiles. There's essentially no overlap between these populations. Okay? So they have higher um, driven, uh, spontaneous activity and super loud driven activity. And I can walk into the lab and just by hearing the spikes know which whether it's an old or young animal that's doing the task, right? Because it's just, they just do way more. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so how is their spatial Greg, tuning? Yeah. Question. Yeah, yeah. Isn't a five, a response in the range of five hertz extremely low for, for a cortical area that's driven by a, by a tone? Yeah, it, uh, I've done this a whole bunch of different ways. These are the average across all locations. Okay, so oh, I'm doing the, ah. the lousy parts too. Okay, so this is really the mean over the whole area? Of the, yeah. Okay, yeah. so the mic, okay, okay. okay, okay. Mm, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. What's the frequency used for the testing tone? The well, frequency? The, it was a broadband noise. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. White noise. White noise. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So, we have a bunch of these. And then uh, I should say that um, Dina Laura Salinas, who's now in uh, Alan Bazbaum's lab, did a lot of this work, and so did James Engel, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time. And what James w hated these, and he, he likes technology and stuff. And he said, we should boil this down into a single figure so that we can look across the population. And so what he did was he took these same data and he'd say, OK, this is the best direction. I'm calling you 0. And this is minus 22.5, minus 45, plus 22.5, plus 45. And let's do it like that. And I'll do that to every cell. So everybody lines up on their best and then flanks out around. Right? And then I can do a color plot with, as a function of time and see what's the output of A1 as a function of time uh, You know in that general way. So this is what you get. This is in young monkeys. And it, so here's the location. This is to the right and to the left. This is when the stimulus is on. Okay? And red is lots of activity and blue is no activity. And you see everybody lines up at zero like they're supposed to. And you can see it's pretty broad. I showed you that before. right? So it's, it's, uh, the, the best activity is on the order of plus or minus 80 degrees or so. But it responds to everything. And then there's a little tail of a response and a little offset. And then you're done. And you can do the same thing for CL, and you see, ooh, neato, they're sharper. I did belabored that last time showing you all these fancy metrics, and here he comes and goes, look, it's sharper, right? So it's sharper. <clears throat> what happens when you do these to old monkeys? Okay. These are uh, what you get with the old monkeys. And you see they're different. Okay? And they're different in a bunch of kinds of ways. One way is that, well, the A1 kind of looks the same. It's really broad, right? It doesn't really last quite as long. There's not much of this tail, but you know, there you go. And then CL looks way different. It doesn't get sharper. Okay? It, stays, it stays very broad. And the other thing that's probably hard for you guys to see is that the latency is even and shorter. And I'll show you that a little bit better in a second. And then there's this business. right? What's this oscillatory behavior? That's new too. Right? I don't, yeah, I, I, every, everybody who's ever looked at this and thought about it gets this kind of expression like, right? <laughs> including me. right? And I still don't, if, if you don't have that expression, if you go, I would really like to talk to you, because <laughs> I, I don't understand this. You have normalized this now, right? Oh, absolutely. And if I had, peak, yeah. peak values are rather dramatically different. Very dramatically right? different. So, so yeah. maybe the, the tail, the tail there for A1 might be compare, might be comparable in its, in its response uh, amplitude, but it, you won't see it because you normalize it you, against that, a much higher. That might be true yeah. because if you if you if you use this. Um, value over here. Right. This is all. This is all blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't see anything. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, but uh, the latency thing I can wrap my head around. Okay, so what James did next is said, you know, this is all cool. All these different colors. Let's do it a little bit differently. Let's just look at the first 50 milliseconds. Okay, so we'll get rid of all this stuff. Right. I'm going to take the first five milliseconds when the sound is still in the air and it's not counting yet. I'm going to count the spikes. That's spontaneous. I'm coloring that green. Then I'm going to ask for each of these you know, pixels, if you will, uh, are you above or below that, statistically? Right? And if you're below it, you're blue. If you're above it, you're red. Okay? And let's see what that looks like. Okay, and this is what it looks like for the young guys. And this is pretty cool, actually. So you see in A1, there's a little bit of blue, right? 
and pretty even uh, latency across location. And in CL, you see lots more blue that's kind of carving out this uh, response. So it's carving out the flanks. And this is consistent with all kinds of stuff that we know that some sort of suppression or inhibition, lateral inhibition or whatever, is basically forming a sharper um, spatial tuning curve than you normally get. Okay? And, and you get the longer latency because CL is a second order or place. Everything makes perfect sense. Right? Then you do it in the old monkeys, and you see something completely different again. Okay? So it's the, the, was there an audible gasp that I hear? <laughs> it's flat. There's no blue. Okay, that's the first obvious thing to see. It's straight, right? It's down here around, what, 12 milliseconds, whereas these guys are around 20, right? So it's super short, and there's no difference between the two, okay? This is completely consistent with this high spontaneous activity, right, and lack of inhibition, okay? And it's telling me that what's happening here is that whatever is doing this is gone for these older animals, okay? And that's what's, that's what's screwing the, the whole thing up. Okay, and for some reason I have this on here again. Not really sure why. I think it's to make the point that A1 and CL, except for the amplitude, aren't a whole lot different. Okay, because that's what I say here. <clears throat> it's about the same. And there's uh, not a sharpening of the spatial tuning from A1 to CL. Wait, why do you say it's the same? They look rather different. Maybe go back. Yeah, there's, the, it is. A, back. Oh, 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 sorry. This part is, right? Which yeah. part? Here. Well, the spatial, so this, this is showing us the spatial tuning, right? Uh, this, is very, this is very different. The latency is very different. Yeah, 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 it's completely different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I should probably, spatial tuning, yeah. <clears throat> okay, and what you see is there's not a sharpening of spatial tuning from A1 to CL in the old monkeys compared to the younger animals. And I think this is um, scary, right? Because if you think about um, how the brain, how we like to think about how the cerebral cortex works, we think of it as you come into the primary area, and then in these subsequent stations, you carve out different features, and that's how you represent different things, and that's why we're so cool, right? And if you can't do that very well, what happens to things that take a lot of processing to get to? It, like cognition, right? So being, un, being poorly able to move along the hierarchy could be a very general mechanism of general cognitive decline. That's why as you get older, you don't necessarily have Alzheimer's or anything, but you're just moving slower, right? And that could be part of the way. OK, so yes? You know, bring your engineers. Okay. What was so, that? Yeah, okay. Um, Talk slowly. Yeah. Look, okay. look right, right at him. It's, it's all right. Um, in, uh, in visual system stuff, uh, looking at age of perception, what they there's a lot of things to the effect of, say, if you look at isolated letters, giant age effect. If you but if you look at uh, same letters in text, no decrement whatsoever. So maybe. And the interpretation in that literature is that you go much more into a sort of top-down influence. Hmm. And you I'm not bring, familiar with that literature. And so. you bring more cognition to it. So maybe you might, if your periphery is getting bad, you might want to flatten that periphery out and bring all your inference to the. Yeah, that might be a way to do it. Yeah. And from a cognitive perspective, disinhibition also has its advantages. From a cognitive point of view, vision yeah. has its advantages. Yeah. If you're less norm-bound, you know. Yeah. That's why we drink alcohol, no? <laughs> okay. okay. Are there any other questions? Because I'm going to get... Yeah. Uh, is there any effect on, uh, let's say, early training? For example, if you train young monkeys uh, to... To recognize, uh, like, maybe a sharpened tuning curve, and when, when they get old, do you see this effect again? Like um, okay. In... Unknown, right? In monkeys, certainly. So there's... Um, you know, I, I used to be... I, I got into the auditory thing to be in the top five, right? <clears throat> as far as aging in the cortex and monkeys goes, there's me and a guy in, uh, in Utah, right? So I'm still in the top five there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if you do auditory, I'm the guy, right? <clears throat> and, uh, but uh, there's been work in rats, uh, and what you can see is that you can do, you, you see sa the exact same kinds of things, right? It, they haven't done space yet, but they've done temporal processing things. And what you can do is you can train them up with the luminosity kinds of things, and they get better, right? And they have difference with gene expression, and they do all that kind of stuff too, right? So, but I don't know, no one's ever, I mean, I'm the one who's done anything, so, and I didn't do what you suggested, so. So we're screwed. Yeah, we're, for now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Top down. Top down, okay. 
Okay, so what, if anything, does any of this have to do with the development and or with evolution? Okay, so um, <clears throat> now this is purely speculative, and you can fall asleep or leave or stand up and storm out or whatever you want, because I'm just going to make stuff up now. <laughs> okay, so when you think about uh, the somatosensory cortex, I'm going to go back to that. Um, you're used to the homunculi's, right? And what I've showed you is that you can mess with this homunculus a little bit, right? You can make its finger bigger or smaller or whatever. <clears throat> And uh, that's the somatosensory cortex. So I didn't have the courage to ask Leah for a slide, so I just took it off the internet. <clears throat> but I like this one because um, it's a circle. And it's showing the primary somatosensory cortex, which is in red. And here it is in the macaques and the, and the marmoset, which is a new world monkey as well. And uh, the point here is that it's true that there's a, a, a somatosensory S1, if you will, in all these different mammals. It's a little bit different in primates, though. Okay, so it's, it's, and there's been some debate. So in primates, it's considered to be area 3B. Right, so this is um, taken from uh, Jeff Padberg's paper. He was a postdoc with Leah, and it shows really nicely that the somatosensory cortex of the macaque, you have 3B, which is S1, it's this cutaneous representation. And then uh, there's 3A, which we talked about, which is deep, right, they call it deep. And then area 1, is also cutaneous, and they have um, opposite maps. So the digit tips are over here, and then it goes to the palm, and then the palm and the digit tips. Okay. And then there's area two, which is also deep, and then you go to area five, which is deep and visual and all kinds of cool parietal lobe stuff. Okay. So this is how it looks in the old world monkey in the macaque. Um, Jeff also did a really cool study that um, I've been chewing on for ten years to try to figure out what what it really means. And um, here again is the macaque. This is from Tim Pons. This is a, a study that uh, Liz Disbro did with, with Leah. And here you see area two, which is deep. There's this cutaneous little bit here. And then you go into area five, which is visual and, and um, deep. And then um, Jeff did this in T monkeys, I think, right? And what you see here is that there's 3B, like you're supposed to be. There's one, which is cutaneous, like it's supposed to be. And there's really not really much in the way of an area two. It kind of goes right to area five, right? So do New World Monkeys have an area too. It doesn't look like these particular ones do. I did a little bit of homework. I remember uh, Kelly Huffman, when she was in Leah's lab, did a bunch of mapping of 3A, uh, which is up here. And you guys called it 1 slash 2, because it's just like kind of weird. Right? So is there a 2? So how would you make a new, a new cortical field? Right? How could you actually pull this off? Well, you, and we've learned a lot in the last few days about that. OK, so um, one thing is, well, you need some sort of substrate for this sort of thing. right? And if you uh, look, this is a paper from uh, John Costa's group, if you stick a tracer into, say, 3B, and you look and see what are all the neurons that project to it, you see that they're all over the place. And if you do neuroanatomical studies and you inject tracers, like um, Leah does all the time, you see patterns and stuff like this. It's not from one box to the next. It's all scattered all over the place. Here I'd like to give a shout out to Jimmy Dooley. This is from his thesis. He was a graduate student of Leah's until last week when he just uh, finished his dissertation. And this is an injection into the rostral part, uh, just rostral to S1 and the monodelphus, and you see that it's getting input from all kinds of different places. Okay? And these are generally also reciprocal. right? So it's, it's getting input from a bunch of places and it's sending output to a bunch of places. Similar deal, this is again from John's group, and you see patchiness all over the place. So my point there is that you have all kinds of widespread anatomical connections by which you can mess things up with. Right? And then remember these guys, right? So we train up some animals, and we, they get better with practice. And what you see is that you get this nice correlation, right? Now what I want to point out here, which gets to Paul's question a little bit too, is this is from four different monkeys. And these are the learning curves of these four monkeys. Okay? So some monkeys, so the dark ones are the trained digit. And they start out, and over the course of a month or two, you get better and better, except for this guy, right? And the untrained digit doesn't really get much better. And that gives you this enormous variability. Okay, so different animals can learn better th things differently. Right? How do we see here that the untrained digit doesn't get better? Uh, it doesn't get much better. Now, yeah. where do we this see one that? does. This one did. Uh, that one didn't. That one technically did. That one did. This one didn't. Right? So it gets a little better, but it stays bad. Okay. Well, what's actually interesting is the non-trained digit that also gets better. Uh, yeah, but remember that had the really big receptive fields, and a bunch of stuff happened there too, right? So, and it's and it's on this thing, and so it's getting some kind of stimulation. And if it can feel anything, it's going to use it all. Right. <clears throat> okay. So the kicker here is remember these. Okay. So here I'm showing you 
um, the area, just 3A, so 3B's down here, this is 3A. And now if it's a dot, it's a well-behaved 3A cell that's deep. And if it's colored in, it's some sort of cutaneous response. Okay? And what you see, so here's the other hemisphere of three of these guys. This is all pretty much normal. This is the passively stimulated. This is all pretty much normal. But some of these guys are, have huge amounts of cutaneous receptor fields, right? And, and some have less, right? So these guys are the ones that did better, and these guys are the ones that didn't do as well. Okay, so you have enormous variability also in how much your brain changes with this. And originally when I thought about this, I thought, okay, this is, this is fine. This is uh, very adaptable because if you can change your brain, right, you're going to want to change your brain because the seasons change, right? So if you're an insectivore or something like that, or if you like to eat bugs, you're not going to get many bugs in the wintertime, but you will in the summertime, so you have to change your strategies, do different things. You're not going to use your hands in different ways depending on the season. I mean, that, that makes sense. And if you can move your brain maps around, you get really good at it, and you think, oh, you know, first day of snow skiing, I'm not that good. Last day of skiing, I'm much better, right? And so I can get good or, or bad or whatever. And, and there's precedence for animals changing things by the seasons. They can change their fur color. They can change all kinds of stuff. Okay, so I happily bopped along for, you know, until Jeff's paper, thinking um, this is all that there is to it. There's nothing to do, it's got nothing to do with evolution at all. Right? <clears throat> and then, of course, what happens though, and Barbara brought this up, what happens if it hits the fan, right? When the, when the meteor hits, right, if, even if it's a local event like in Siberia, if you're used to live around here, you're going to have to move or change your strategies tomorrow, right? If it hits, you know, the, the earth when the dinosaurs are around, you have to change your strategy today. Right? Because everything's going to be different for probably in, you know, the rest of my life. Or if it goes more gradual, you might have to change your strategy too. Right? <clears throat> so, so if you have to change your strategy, right, who's going to do better? Right? So this is a monkey that basically, if you didn't know anything, right, you walked along, you would not call this Area 3A. This is a completely different cortical field. This monkey made a cortical field in two months right, of just, i got to listen to this so I can eat. Right? And I got good at it, and I made a new cortical field. Because whatever I need to do, OK. So what did 3A usually do in this guy? I mean, what was the deficit? That's something Mike Zaniga always asked me. It's a zero-sum game. You change one thing, you have to lose another. Right? And that's certainly when uh, you know, the, the precursors and, the, and what Barbara was talking about on the owl monkey, how you change your, your fates, and you delay development, and, and you increase it or whatever. You make more neurons, and now you can do what 3A used to be able to do, or now you can move it over and do something new, et cetera. So that's what I mean by evolution on a nanosecond scale, right? You don't need 60 million years to make a cortical field. I made one in two months, right? And if you do this kind of stuff, and then it hits the fan, and now you have to you know, eat different kinds of bugs or whatever, then these are the guys that are going to be able to, to move forward and procreate, right? And hope to get new gene expression and all this other stuff that we heard about up to now, OK? So that's, um, that's my hypothesis on how you can go from this to that, right? And it doesn't necessarily have to take a super long time. OK, I think I will finish there. I'd like to thank everybody uh, that participated in this work and, and uh, in my thinking. Uh, certainly, uh, everybody who paid it for it, but mostly for you guys for sticking with it and you know, holding off lunch for a little while. So thank you all very much. Great. Um, I think what? Okay, young people first. <laughs> of course, they're all stacked out there on the side of the room. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you for the talk. It was really, really nice. I just. Um, when you talked about um, how the degradation of hearing uh, when you get older, I just keep. Uh, thinking of my grandmother, and I was wondering how you could explain the fact that she's like 93 years old. She barely hears anything. Like, we're like, hey, grandma, you're a pill or something. She never hears it. And then suddenly, when you start mumbling or you say, oh, we hid it in her dessert, she goes like, I heard that. Is there <laughs> any sort of selective hearing in the elderly or something? Because I really cannot understand or explain it. Um, well, there's. There's a long history of selective uh, auditory attention and listening, but as a husband, I'm not allowed to divulge that secret. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll get kicked out of the club. <laughs> but um, another, another uh, real hallmark deficit in aging is uh, attention-based, right? And it, and it has been shown to fluctuate. So uh, they, have, they have a harder time uh, 
with directed attention, and it can wax and wane. And so one plausible explanation, other than that your grandma only, she's wise, right, certainly, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so there's always kind of a good idea to keep in mind what's going on and just pick your spots. But it could be that sort of thing, too, where it's just hard, hard to pay attention, and so that's when it's harder to hear. No, I think your grandmother just figured out how gullible you are. That's all. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. It's very interesting. We have been working with sounds for many times here, and uh, I have two questions. One is goes in the same direction as the, the previous questions, that if you know, if you have tried to... Because you, you're talking about the cognitive load of, of the, the sound location. So that means if you're talking about cognitive load, it's much concern, you have to concern about timbre. Because for example, if you're using a, a, a wide spectrum, white noise, you don't convey a, a timbre information. And for many uh, aiding people, timbre takes a lot of importance because they know uh, by memory, what the sound means. Mm -hmm. So that, that means, this is my first question, which is, has been done some research taking care of the location and aging connect to timer and memory. That's the, the first one. The okay. second one is, that's a binaural location is based very much in the position of your head yeah. in relates to the sound source. It has been uh, be ensured that the location of the head of the monks or the other guys are really in center. How much the deviation of the head is taking in, in account to the location? Well, I mean, because if you move your head, you compensate the location. Or oh, one way is instead of locating the loudspeakers from one side to another side, is put the sound in the center and put on the sound in the center location of uh, the spatial distribution. It, it, it would be a different, uh, let's say, test. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because if you give one sound from this side only, it, 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 if your head is moving a little bit like that, you're paying more, you're locating more in this side. Right. If you put a sound in front and have the azimuth of the sound very in the center of the brain, but you put the information for in, in a stereo field, you can have tests differently. It's, it's much more like the people do in binaural testing with the right. headphones. Right. So that, that means or the two questions I, I, I'd like to, to ask you. OK, so with respect to the head movements, um, you're absolutely right. Moving your head helps you localize sounds very much. These are brief sounds, so they're hard to localize. The monkeys have a head post on their head, and they don't move at all. Their skull is fixed. Okay, so their ear canals are fixed, so that's not an issue, right? We have to do that so we can stick the electrode in and it doesn't poke too far, right? The people were in a, a bite bar, so they had the same thing, right, when I did that. But you're absolutely right, moving your head is really going to muck that up. The first question was on cognitive load and, uh, <clears throat> okay, so, uh, and, and timbre. And uh, these experiments that I told you about today, it's all 200 millisecond broadband noise, and you're absolutely right, to be able to recognize uh, words, et cetera, it helps to have a model in your head. And, and what happens in aging is, and we do this all the time, what happens in aging is um, you start uh, making up for missed words, right? <clears throat> so you don't quite understand what they said. Did they say fight or flight, right? They must have said flight because they're talking about this thing. And they will make up this model of what the conversation is about, right, that's based on all these filling in errors, right? So we all fill in errors, but it's usually just one word every now and then. If you're doing, you know, 30 or 40 percent of what you're hearing is you're assuming is what you're thinking about, then um, you find yourself not understanding a damn thing, right? Because you're talking about mowing the lawn and they're talking about going swimming later or something like that, right? So <clears throat> what happens in what humans do to compensate usually is exactly what you said. They use what they expect to hear, and words are, are much more complex and easier to discriminate than um, you know, broadband noise from a place. We're doing a bunch of experiments now on both young and old animals where we use a, uh, amplitude modulated noise as one of the stimuli, right? And it's in the flutterish range, so they go from maybe 17 to 50 or 60 hertz or something like that. And uh, what we find there is that the old monkeys are just having a heck of a time learning this task, 
right? So they're having a really hard time picking up. So they have to discriminate either the location, which they do pretty well, or they have to discriminate the frequency of the AM rate, right? So usually it either goes faster or slower, and they, and they really suffer from that. And uh, humans do much better, and I think we do better because we have some other kind of context to put that in, right? But as far as I know, that's the extent of the, of the thing. And what we've also noticed about cognitive load is um, in the young monkeys, they're very good at hearing, here's the, here's the first stimulus, here's the second, is the second faster or slower than the first? The old monkeys do way better if you give them two to compare to. It like, takes them two tries to listen before they can hold that in memory long enough to, to decide if the next one was faster or slower. Right? So that's all yeah. I can say about that. Thank you, Mark. So thanks for the uh, talk. Um, you have uh, linked this uh, cortical plasticity now at the very end with the change of seasons. Uh -huh. But what if I want to remember next spring why I learned uh, this, is, this is spring? I mean, <laughs> is it, um, I mean, would, if, if this plasticity is changing the map, um, the, would it be interesting that there is like a possibility that contextually the, the, the a cortical tissue can have different uh, information or functions and that uh, it's not only going from one to another, it's not always forgetting one and, or overwriting one by the other, but just the uh, possibility of, uh, I don't know if you have considered this. You, you know, I, uh, that's a great question, and I thought of that too. It's, what, is, what is known is that if you learn something, you learn a new task, and then you stop doing it for a while, you get worse, but you get back to as good as you were much faster than if you'd never learned it in the first place. That's pretty common. And so by this line of thinking, what, what you would, I would uh, predict, I guess, is uh, so imagine that I took one of those monkeys that got really good and had all those map changes, and then I just put him back in his cage and gave him biscuits like the rest for uh, you know, three or four or five months and came back. I predicted it would look almost normal. Right? <clears throat> and I also predict that if I didn't put him in the, in the apparatus again, he'd get fast. Be, be good again much quicker than a naive animal, and his maps would change back, right? So there, I think that what happens is, um, here's you, you're, you're a neuron here, and you've got your synaptic way, it's all figured out, and you're just a normal monkey neuron, right? <clears throat> Something happens, and now you, you're needed to do a new job, right? And so you release some weights, and you increase others, right? But you remember those ones before. Right? And you strengthen them, because you've got all those proteins and all that scaffolding and all that stuff already there, right? You're just not listening to them so much. And now you basically have twin states if you can survive them, right? And, and the real cool question is, well, how many states can you have, right? I mean, how, how, how many different maps can be in the same, can this one neuron participate in over the course of the lifetime, right? And back and forth. It's just a hypothesis. I don't know of any evidence to support or refute it. Yeah. Barbara has the urgent need oh, okay. to jump the queue. So Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in support of that, the two-state thing, the one really cool allometric fact about birds, seasonal versus migratory birds. So you think that migratory birds, they do this complicated thing of traveling. It turns out those are the ones with the small brains. It's the ones that stay in place and have to do summer and winter both that have the really big brains across birds. So one thing you can do is, is uh, be the animal with a lot more brain, uh, and maybe that's where you put your extra representation. Uh, so going back to the age-related hearing loss, uh, you, uh, you suggested that this was in uh, may involve the cortical inhibition uh, or loss of cortical inhibition. Yes. Uh, and that would seem to make sense then of your reverberation because the, the, the loss of the cortical inhibition would then lead to changes in the dynamics. So, the, so initially the uh, response could become more exaggerated than it would be in a younger brain and then some, maybe the inhibition comes in later or there's less of it, but it dampens down and then there's some reverberation as a consequence of that. So I think there's, there's quite a lot of literature showing how these interneurons are involved in creating smooth dynamics. So if you mess around with them, that's the kind of thing you might expect to happen. 
the reverberations. Yeah. Yeah. And then I also wondered, you could work with Steve on this, whether it's the microglia that eating all the cortical interneurons. <laughs> They, they have uh, tangles and plaques and all that stuff in their brains, so they're, they're losing real estate yeah. as, they, as they age. Sorry, only to add uh, in this comment, because reverberation is the per sonic parameter that gives cues about the space, the space. Right. So that means where you are, it's much more concerned with the reverberation than with location. So if you are here, it's because even you see the sound where they are, but the reverberation gives a cue of the space. I, I guess reverberation is very important to, to these parameters. Yeah. Do you want, so thank you. So the light is on, it's on. Okay, so thank you for the great talk. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the role of reward on plasticity in the, in the, in the maps that you saw, that you showed like in the, there's so much yeah, sensory maps. Right, that's a really, that's a really good question. That, um, so, so when you're working with monkeys, uh, reward's really tricky because they don't care about your career at all. <laughs> <laughs> they could really, they're completely indifferent about it, frankly. Uh, and so you have to give them something that they want to make that work. And uh, some monkeys just don't really care about anything at all, and so they don't ever do very well, right? So what you'd like to be able to do is get the monkey to actually work and tell you what it really perceives and manipulate reward in a, in a way, that, in, a, in a parametric way, right? It's very difficult to do. I mean, you can do it to people a little bit, but then you can't do the single unit recording and all that stuff. But, but you had in your experiment like two different things, right? Like in the first experiment, well, you had like the, the, the auditory frequency that was like changing. Yes. And then you had the tactile frequency that was changing. Yes. But then the, the monkeys were trained to, the monkeys were trained to pay attention only to one yes. of the cues because that was the one rewarded, right? right? And in that sense then you 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 saw like uh, changes in the in the cortical maps and the tuning curves only in the in the modality that was rewarded, right? Right. So in this sense you could argue that actually there is a strong link between the modality that is rewarded and then plasticity that is triggered. So then I was wondering, like, what is the mechanism, if you have any speculation, what would be the mechanism that actually triggers plasticity in the cortex due to a reward signal? Okay, due to the re reward signal. So, uh, <clears throat> well, if I speculated the last 15 minutes, so why stop now, right? Um, dopamine is going to, so we know, do, it's got to be dopamine, right? So, so Mike Kilgard's work shows that if you stimulate uh, uh, nucleus basalis, y you get plasticity without attention or training or any of that kind of stuff, right? <clears throat> and uh, Sharon Giuliano showed years ago that if you block acetylcholine, you don't get plasticity after digit amputation. So acetylcholine is critical for it to work, right? And um, norepinephrine has been shown that that's classic work from uh, Olds and those folks showed that norepinephrine was critical for plasticity based from classical conditioning, right? And dopamine, I don't follow this literature so much, but I can't imagine somebody like... Um, has he looked at dopamine? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, all three of those guys are, are doing something. And, um, you know, you could say that... You, you, could, you could interpret that data to say that it's entirely based on the reward contingency and the dopamine that gets released. You could say it's entirely based on that I was paying attention and now I see the coin is there. Okay, you can base it all, probably whatever norepinephrine does naturally, right? You could blame it on that. So it's almost certainly all those things going on at once. And like I said, if you, if you were to, if you were to um, lesion the nucleus accumbens so you don't have this dopamine reward anymore, monkey's probably not going to do the task, right? So you're going to be stuck with that. <clears throat> yeah. I have a question about the protocol. Would you say that you would have the same result in a 3D environment with the speakers um, above, the, um, above the monkey? And also to come back to this idea of uh, reverberation, um, to get the distance of the sound. So you have the, the orientation, the direction, but also the distance. And yeah, so if you were to do elevation, um, I, I think... S so if you were to do this experiment in elevation, I predict that CL would uh, also have sharper two-dimensional, I guess, receptive fields, right? And we had done studies before that showed that, but we could just do frontal space because 
you know, 16 speakers in this plane is great, but how many do you need to do the sphere, right? Which is now suddenly uh, impractical. So I would predict that I would predict that in CL you're going to have sharper spatial tuning. It's going to be elongated vertically because we don't localize sounds uh, vertically as well as we do horizontally, and it would um, and it would match up using the exact same kind of modeling parameters, etc. Right? Distance is really tricky, and reverberation. So this is in a sound booth with the foam and all that stuff. So it's an anechoic chamber, right? So there's not any of these reverberations. There's a lot of interest now in in, in studying that. I mean, it used to be um, you had to have this perfectly bizarre environment that had no echoes and, and all these things in order to study hearing and um, spend a whole ton of money on trying to get that to happen, whereas we're never in anechoic environments, right? Maybe in a forest after a snowfall or something, but usually there's reverberations all the time, and, and we simply don't study it, right? But predict, I, I would imagine that if I could have done this experiment in, um, in a regular room full of a bunch of stuff that the monkey is comfortable being in, everything would line up much better, right? Because we're just looking at, I'm just counting up the spikes in, in this kind of weird stimulus that's not something that the animal is used to hearing, right? And trying to make some sense out of it as opposed to something that's like a real stimulus that the animal really does hear and, and listen to and try to, try to deal with, right? So the ideal experiment to me would be to have the monkey in the woods, right? And have my 10,000 electrodes in its auditory cortex and have little microphones that is tympanic membrane, right? And what are you hearing and what is your brain doing? And it would probably make a heck of a lot more sense than taking a monkey, sticking him in a chair, making him look right this direction. My nose itches, I can't reach it, and I listen to these sounds that mean nothing to me except I want a little bit of juice, right? And my brain is going to somehow help me do that, right? So, so Greg, to, in some of what you're showing is, is that these, these motor areas or the auditory cortex is sort of being very much driven by the, the statistics of the input it's exposed to, correct? But you might want to put some constraints on that, otherwise you're completely at the mercy of what your environment is giving you, of how your environment is, is addressing the system. So what kind of constraints do you see are playing a role in assuring that you are, as you keep on, let's say, exploring novelty in that input space? Right, so why don't you just perseverate on one thing and change your brain into right. now all I can do is this one thing, right. Okay, so again, this is a totally artificial situation. I take the monkey, I say, you have to do this for three hours a day or you don't eat, right? And I'm actually surprised that, uh, so, so what would happen if you said, okay, you have to do this or you won't eat, and then when you go back to your cage, it's not just a cage with bars, it's got all kinds of stuff that you want to manipulate, so you use your hands for other stuff too, then you're going to have to balance out somehow, right? So as long as you, uh, you know, moderation is key, Paul, I think. <laughs> Otherwise... <laughs> I'll take that to heart, Greg. Thank you. Those are wise words to end, up, end up with. Thank you. Thank you.